Gwinnett Medical Center is now entering Peachtree Corners. Conveniently located in the heart of this thriving community, our new center offers first-rate primary care and specialty services, including cardiology, gastroenterology, neurology, OBGYN, orthopedics, 3D mammography, and x-ray. Learn more about how GMC is making industry-leading healthcare more convenient than ever at GwinnettMedicalCenter.org slash PTC. The conversation is so comprehensive. It's micro-mobility, but it's also building a, a workforce that's not just the future of work, but how do you build dignity into the future of work? Um, we talk about economic mobility. I think for us, in reframing the narrative, we want to talk about not just autonomous, electric, and, and uh, micro-mobility. We want to talk about social mobility, economic mobility. We want to talk about human capital alongside venture capital. And we want to make sure the, equitable, the infrastructure is equitable you know, while it's intelligent. You're listening to Peachtree Corners Life, a weekly online radio show sharing ideas, opinions, and news about the city of Peachtree Corners. Now, your host, Rico Figliolini. Hi, this is Rico Figliolini, host of Peachtree Corners Life, the podcast that's centered here in the city of Peachtree Corners, just north of Atlanta. The city of Atlanta that's going to be hosting, for the first time, the Smart City Expo Atlanta which is an offshoot. It's the U.S. edition of Smart City Expo World Congress that's held every year since 2011 in Barcelona. And uh, over the years, they've expanded to other cities, shoots like Brazil, Turkey, Japan, Mexico, Argentina, other countries. And this is the fifth time in the United States. So um, what I want to do is bring on Artie Tandon, who's the co-founder of, um, of the Smart City Expo. So let's bring her on. Hey, Artie, how are you? Hi, Rico. Thanks for having me. No, this is great. I appreciate you uh, bearing, you know, with me and uh, for the technical difficulties we were <laughs> before. Uh, but uh, thank you for coming on. My pleasure. So tell us a little bit about Artie. Tell us who you are and how you got to Smart City Expo and stuff. To, to give us a brief. Thank you for asking. So I'm actually a lawyer by trade. Um, and many years ago, I was working in entertainment and ended up working on a project um, for a client of mine who was serving uh, 14 years in federal prison. And I um, really understood what, at that time, what, you know, how do we actually really build an inclusive economy? And I spent five years working pro bono for this case. And uh, President Bush had granted a commutation to my client in 2008. And since then, I've been really trying to understand, you know, how do we use sports, entertainment, and marry it with justice? Um, I went on to produce a bunch of films. And then um, oh. in 2000, or actually probably three years ago, I was asked to be the executive director of Smart Cities New York. Um, and in that process, I really want to talk about what makes a city smart and mm -hmm. sort of redefine the term. And we ended up having 2,000 people from over 80 countries, over 30 countries. Um, but we had the CEOs of UNICEF and Robin Hood and the Boys and Girls Club in conversation with the MasterCards and the Microsofts. And we really felt that everyone had to have a seat at the table if we were going to make sure we had an inclusive 21st century economy. And so last year, Mayor Bottoms was at our conference and... Um, I had established a relationship with Fira, and we had decided, you know, she had a focus on developing a strong smart city strategy, and Atlanta would be an ideal place to host the first uh, Smart City Expo World event in the U.S. So you ran, you helped run the Barcelona event then? No, I ran a, a separate New York um, New, New event. York, okay. Yeah, it was just a smart city conference. Oh, okay. So, but this is the big expo. Then, this is the big one. Yeah, this is really exciting. So, Smart City Expo World Congress, which is right. the original uh, tentpole event, it's happened since 2011 right. in Barcelona. 20,000 people attend. It's basically the CES for cities. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about it is that the rest of the world has really been focused on smart city strategies. So, when you think about actually countries that have had conflict, they've leapfrogged into the future because they didn't have legacy issues to deal with that we have in the United States. 
And so they're deploying uh, all sorts of incredible work in Estonia and Kosovo and Rwanda. Um, and so Smart City Expo World Congress has been convening these thought leaders from, since 2011. Okay. So with uh, the mayor of Atlanta talking, sort of getting it set up here in Atlanta, now you can, eventually it's going to be a three-year three year deal, I'm assuming. Yeah, we, we, our goal is to really plant ourselves in Atlanta, make this the tentpole event uh, for the United States. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's hosted in Atlanta, but it's actually a national event. And part yeah. of the reason for that is because a lot of the people from the public sector in the U.S. can't justify or really afford sending you know, their CIOs to Barcelona. And so they're right. missing out on a lot of the sharing of best practices that are happening, especially... You know, the Nordic countries are so ahead of us on circular economy and sustainability mm -hmm. and people are working on cyber around the world. And so we really genuinely felt that this conference is a national conference. And if you're a CIO from South Dakota or from Minnesota, you have the same challenges that most cities do. And, and we'd love to you know, have them come and, and learn. So and uh, if I understand correctly, too, I mean, the idea is that smart city is not just about corporations or, or upper or middle class people that can afford, afford an iPhone ring, let's say, or something like that. It's really bring it, bring it, it to an equitable position, right? right. Um, the people on, on the street, if you will, that can feel the effects of a smart city. That's, that's what this theme is, I guess, for Atlanta. Yeah. So our theme is let's redefine the term smart. Mm -hmm. Um, People ask me all the time, like the most inevitable question I get is, what is a smart city? And I did a presentation for the State Department a few weeks ago, and, and my response was increasing quality of life. And so what does that mean? How do you use the data to increase quality of life? So my dear friend, the mayor of Helsinki, he says his goal is to give every citizen one hour back in their day. Hmm. And so if you come from that premise, right, you think about like, so if you knew your train was going to be 20 minutes late, you may take a bus, you may take a bike, you may do right. something else, right? So how do you make those choices so that you can go home and spend more time with your family? And that's how we look at what makes the city smart is how we're deploying the technology. I'd love to just give you a few examples. I know sure. you've got a bunch of questions. But yeah. so, so NYU Langone, and he's going to be one of our speakers, Dr. Gorovich, um, did a study on population health and like the health of cities. So it's, it's affordable housing, transportation, mm -hmm. um, the actual health and uh, in a few cities. And one of the cities was Providence, Rhode Island, I believe. And again, like I, we have 250 speakers. So if I'm missing something, let me know. But no, one of the things he realized was that um, absenteeism was a really big issue in Providence. So what do you do with that data? Well, the mayor ended up putting washing machines in the public schools, right? Oh. That is how you create equity. That is where you say, we're going to give every child the opportunity to learn, and we don't want them to be ashamed that they can't uh, come to school, and we're going to make sure that they have a safe environment from which that they can prosper, right? That to us is equity. Like other examples of that are, you know, there are all these amazing energy generating pavements that are being used in stadiums and in, in universities. So you generate energy off the foot traffic. Well, why don't we put that on a basketball court in the Bronx? Yeah. Right? If you want people to understand what the 21st century is going to look like, and they think it's robots and they think it's automation, sure. it's also let's meet people where they are, and that's how this conference is designed, and that's why we're redefining the term smart. That's cool because people think it's Amazon delivering this stuff by drone. They can't wait for that because that would be easy, I guess. Or well, delivery within an hour or two, right? Right. Using AI machine learning to be able to almost predict what you may want in the next two hours to work. Right. But um, but I I like that idea, and it's not too far flung out to say that it could happen within years as opposed to within a decade or two, right? It's, it's right time. here, and I think what we're doing is helping mayors and cities understand that it's literally right here but your constituents have to understand it we have to meet people where they are so like you mentioned drones drones can be scary to some people and it mm -hmm. also can be helpful in the sense where you reduce congestion on the streets right mm -hmm. like so it, there has to be a balance and uh that's the key that's why the integrated approach to cities is so important 
I think what happened in the past, it was like the smart water meter, the smart parking meter, and those are really important. But if they're not interoperable, a city ends up not knowing what the right hand's doing with its left hand. And does that almost mean that you want sort of, uh, you know, there's the UI, right? Universal integration, right? Um, that's a problem with a lot of these smart devices. You have the Apple iHome, or you have the iHome, the Apple Home. You have all these devices, um, Alexa and stuff. Can they integrate together? Can we? Can, is there a, a highway that we can all go on? If you will? And so one great way to look at that, yeah. uh, Rico, is... So a few years ago, the city of Columbus won the big smart city transportation, uh, the smart city challenge that was issued by the DOT. And I think 83 cities applied. And uh, the reason Columbus won is because women couldn't get to the hospital in time to deliver their babies. And they came from a very human issue and decided that if they won the grant, they would then adjust how their roads and their emergency response, and how their police operated. So when you think about integration, the way you just said it, how do we take a human problem and then get everybody to participate mm. on that highway so that we can clear it? And so what happened was they ended up changing their bike lanes, their emergency response, and they ended up addressing climate issues, right? Because you have now they put in electric buses and they created bus lanes. And so the city started to move better. The environment was better, but it required everyone to come together and right. do that. So the interoperability doesn't actually have to be between the technology. It actually has to be between the groups that are working to solve the problem. And w would you say that, I think some people think you have to invest a lot. Some people, some cities would have to invest a lot to get there, but maybe that's not the case, right? You have infrastructure money anyway, to spend it wisely makes more sense, no? Yeah, so I think financing is a major issue in the U.S. because we don't have public-private partnership models that are as robust in the rest of the world, like Canada and Australia are leading the way in those places. I think the U.S. Uh, also has, you know, a lot of procurement issues and, like, how do you get from pilot to deployment? Um, those are all issues we're covering at the conference. Um, and so, you know, financing mechanisms are key, and I think a lot of the private sector is looking to help figure out uh, new models. So who would you say already are the um, some of the key players that will be uh, speaking at the expo? That's your That's my favorite question. I have literally 250 speakers and um, so many of them are people, you know, of course, we're so honored to have the CEOs of Cox, the CEOs of SunTrust, the CEO of the Atlanta Braves, and all for different reasons. Um, the CEO of Cox is working on uh, his commitment to sustainability and innovation. He's funded Techstars. Um, he's funded Carbon Lighthouse or invested in Carbon Lighthouse. Um, the CEO of SunTrust is so focused on uh, financial inclusion and public-private partnerships. Um, the CEO of the Atlanta Braves is also obviously focused on public-private partnerships. So think about like all the technology that's advancing a consumer experience inside a stadium, right? Right. And so we have all of them. We're thrilled. We've got TI coming in to talk about the importance of, you know, how do you drive economic development in our communities? And he's doing an incredible job that way. We have John Hope Bryant who will be in conversation with TI. But then we also have a woman named Veronica Scott who runs the Empowerment Plan, who created a jacket for people who are homeless that turns into a sleeping bag. Oh, you know, wow. We've got such extraordinary entrepreneurs and innovators. We have a guy who basically has created a coral, I believe, that regenerates, is helping to regenerate coral reefs. We've got, um, you know, obviously the best of the best from SoftBank Robotics. Uh, we've got BlackRock coming to talk about social impact. Um, we've got Cisco and we've got Southern Company, our founding partner. Yes. Uh, and they are doing extraordinary work to enable the infrastructure for a city to be smart. Now, will some of these companies be part of the exhibitors also? Yes, we have um, 50 plus exhibitors. Uh, my colleague Adam Lennon has done an extraordinary job. Um, we've got two tiny houses. We've got eight different EV, AV vehicles. We actually have the first autonomous electric truck in the world by Enride. Okay. Um, I know that we've got drones and I know that we've got a um, bird doing uh, 
a activation. Um, so, so when you think about, you asked earlier in, in the in the podcast about, you know, what to expect. I mean, the conversation is so comprehensive. It's micro mobility, but it's also building a, a workforce that's not just the future of work, but how do you build dignity into the future of work? Um, we talk about economic mobility. I think for us, in reframing the narrative, we want to talk about not just autonomous electric and and uh, micro mobility we want to talk about social mobility economic mobility we want to talk about human capital alongside venture capital and we want to make sure the equitable the infrastructure is equitable you know while it's intelligent that's exciting i think that you know i have a kid that goes to a stem high school he just started oh. last year right and i own a magazine called peach recorders magazine and we're our next story in the next issue is about technology in the school and how that works and that STEM high school is like four days of school and one digital day and uh, doing online uh, work. Um, you know, I, it's it's interesting to see how young people use smart technology in, in the easiest way because, I mean, they're, they're growing up in that environment. They know no different to a degree. So how – are there any exhibits or any anything along the way that you can talk to about that? Well, you talked about young people, and I'm so glad that you brought them up. Um, for us, a smart city is defined by every generation. So we actually have the Harvard Debate Diversity Council scholars for high school seniors coming in to talk about how they envision the future of cities. Um, we have people with disabilities being represented. We have the top we have top disability commissioners in the country from Chicago, New York, and LA coming to talk about what does it mean to build an inclusive city? And the reason I bring it up is because in New York City, the to cross the street, it's about 22 seconds, which is based on an, a 22-year-old white male. Right. Now, think about the fact that if you have a disability or if you're a parent with a stroller, mm -hmm. right? Like it was, the city wasn't designed for it to be accessible. And so we have, uh, we have the youth, we have... Uh, uh, a lot of, uh, we're really focused on gender issues, um, women leading smart cities, and we're also making sure that minority communities are represented. And just to go back to your STEM question again, I think the key for us is, um, you know, kids especially uh, have new, new ways of learning and acting, and they're almost like they get to leapfrog into the future, right? They don't have the legacy issues that we do when we're working with technology. But when they find a real life way of experiencing it, they're inspired. So like a lot of kids in hip hop, for example, they learned about Nipsey Hussle's smart store out in LA. And what happened to Nipsey Hussle's tragic and all of those things. But he, that, like a lot of innovation is coming from these young people and in the streets. And if we can harness them, uh, you know, in a way that's, safe and exciting so it's like when they're learning stem they can see the real life application for it mm -hmm. that's a lot more exciting I, I would think and and you're right i mean they're using technology at this point so they're not afraid of it right you have older people and, and, and i'm sure in the cities across this country there are a lot of older people if you will that are in position of power um and i saw this when congress originally I think it was about a year ago did um, one of the committees talked about um, security on the line with Google and Facebook and stuff. And the questions that were asked was so out of pace. Touch, it was yeah. The real world, it was scary that these people are actually, you think you would think they're scared for the given the right questions to ask. Uh, it just didn't sound right. And so those are people that have to be convinced that smart technology right, can be a great investment over a period of time and they shouldn't be looking short term. And, and the United States is very mobile oriented as far as like uh, cars, right? And we built our highways right after World War II. I mean, if I look at Europe and other countries, Kyoto and other, other cities around the world, they might have a lot of cars, but they also have lots of bikes. They also handle yes. the traffic a lot differently. Very different from here. In Manhattan, I used to live in Brooklyn in Manhattan. You wouldn't want to cross the street because you never knew when I had that bike was riding fast by. Right. Or a yellow cab is going to, you know, cut the traffic. Or something. Um, yeah, so technology is a big thing um, as far as the cities go, as far as the young people go, and disability. Are there other things we should be looking forward to in this next month? 
Yeah, well, first of all, the opening of Peachtree Corners is very exciting, right? That that speaks to uh, everything that we're doing because to have the, uh, I believe it's the second one and a half mile autonomous test track in the country in Georgia. And basically they're saying for free, we invite all these innovators to come and test their their pilots and their innovations. I mean, that's what people are looking for. And to have it powered by the 5G powered by Sprint, I mean, if we're going to get these kids inspired and take them out of the classroom and then be able to have them demo their work, um, that that's really important for us. And I think that's what's happening in the rest of the world is, you know, you talked about urban planning and cities and, um, you know, we just, we just have to have a design of what we want our cities to look like. Right. Right. And have people move in that direction. I think so too. It takes, it does take foresight. I know that when the city first started, that they had in mind about doing is, is uh, developing a smart city. So they really put it into their budgets. They had forethought about doing that. Um, and they had also an understanding, Brian Johnson, the city manager and the yeah. mayor and the, and the council, in understanding that you want to be able to provide this environment, Curiosity Lab and Peachtree Corners, in a free way because it, it does provide economic impact to the city as well. So, there, there is that, um, but I think being able to get ahead of this, because a lot of other cities will be looking at doing the same thing now right. over the next decade or so. I mean, you have Michigan, the, was it Planet M? Um, yeah. And so it's yeah. exciting to see all that, you know. Yeah. And you have Tesla moving forward with all the stuff they're doing. Right. Um, and the rest of the, co- I mean, we you asked about some of the other people. I mean, what yeah. we're really honored by is. First of all, the support from the private sector and the public sector. But we have, I mean, almost 10 mayors coming from across the country. And I, the mayor of Honolulu to the mayor of Denver to the mayor of Montgomery to the mayor of Newark. And they're all so different. And yet they have the same challenges. And to see how they're addressing them, to see how they're, I mean, we have the president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, Mayor Barnett of Rochester Hills. And he, like so many other mayors, are excited about autonomous mobility because of the fact that, you know, most people don't frame it this way, autonomous mobility is going to help move people with disabilities and the elderly. And think about like the impact that that will have in those communities, right? So, you know, they're, uh, they're already embracing the innovation. The United the US Conference of Mayors, uh, right. their platform is infrastructure, innovation and inclusion. And those are their three pillars and, and the mayors are really rallying around it. You know what I like about this, Artie, is that you're providing the expos, not just, right, you have a lot of speakers, you have a lot of exhibitors, but it's also providing a, a place for people to meet, to brainstorm, really, because they're going to be talking about all, all sorts of things. And I know from experience and from listening to others that you start one way and then you end up somewhere else, right? So mobile mobility, having an autonomous vehicle, can that happen in five years or 10 years? Maybe the delivery aspect of, of autonomous vehicles. Maybe the non-person in the car, if you will. The pizza delivery, for lack of a better way of, of looking at it, may happen sooner than, let's say, a passenger riding for you know without having a steering wheel practically, like in, uh, was it Blade Runner was the movie? Right. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that part might be a little further out. Because you have to build five G. Not into- as far. It's not as far as you think, which is really the fascinating part of it. We're yeah. not Dubai, where we have drone taxis, you know, because they can just sort of put up whatever they want in the air. But right. I will tell you that in conversation with former FAA advisors, they will tell you it's right around the corner. And and I'm sure, you know, Elaine Chow, Secretary Chow, she likes yeah. to use the word self driving, not driverless. Um, and they are, uh, you know, putting in policies for that because you think about the stretch of roads across America, right? Like right. just the trucking, like you can, that's why we have the first autonomous electric truck to join us. I mean, they're, they're it's not that far. They're changing, um, FAA regulations for drones. Mm-hmm. Um, is it a little awkward? Yeah. Like I was sitting out outside of a friend's place the other day, it was a drone overhead and I was quite upset. Like I felt so violated. But at the same time, like if there is a way to start maximizing the air and, you know, creating more public space on the ground, um, that's interesting. So I don't know the the ramifications. 
No, no, I, I, I agree with you. There's so many aspects to it. You, you know, you have counties, you have cities, you have states, federal government, federal highway, state highway, state streets. I mean, it's so many regulations that have to come in right. to bear on this. And then the technology, like Sprint, I mean, there's only a certain amount of places that have 5G right. enabled Sprint, right? enabled areas. And, and Sprint is one of the companies doing it. And one of the companies doing it with us in Technology Park, where our track is at. So, right. because you really can't have autonomous vehicles without that. Correct. With the infrastructure. Yeah. yeah. So, just a lot of stuff, a lot of interesting. It's almost like sci fi in a way, but it's really not because it's almost like near future. Of what's gonna right. Happen. Right. And I think it's just important communicating that to the public. Like, they should feel a part of it. That's why I use the basketball example. Like, if they understood the technology, it can benefit them. Yes, there's a lot of issues around it. I'll be the first to say predictive analytics in the criminal justice space and sure. things like that are, are major issues. But it's like, you know, the one thing that Europe has is GDPR, which we don't have in terms of privacy, which, right. you know, scares people and rightfully so. Uh -huh. um, so I think that there are issues around that. But, but you know, mm. the part of this is what you said. It's, it's to have a dialogue. For people to understand and to reframe their thinking, um, and to help people understand that they too have a role in, in the 21st century. Yeah, I think as much as Americans Americans believe that we're exceptional to a degree, yeah. and that we sort of drive technology or, or the future in some ways, there's a lot of different thinking outside the U.S. Right, Europeans with the privacy that some of the American companies are adopting anyway. I think because right. they know it's going to come this way. Um, and then you got places like Japan with robotics because of their aging population. Right. Exactly. You know, how do you handle that? Right. You know, people right. think robots like, you know, arms and legs, but it doesn't have to be. It could be a right. box, I mean, right. whatever it needs to be. Um, so great stuff. If um, someone wants to be able to attend, this yes. is September 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th. No, it's the 11th, 12th, and 13th at Georgia World Congress Center. Right. Um, tickets can be purchased at www.smartcityexpoatlanta.com. I literally just dated myself because your child would just say smartcityexpoatlanta.com, and I put the www in front of it. Um, That's funny, yes. And, um, and, uh, but, you know, they can reach out to us at info at smartcityexpoatlanta.com. We're happy to answer any questions. Okay. If people would like to attend, exhibit. Um, are just curious. We're, we would love to engage um, and and have them be part of this community. What about um, and they can follow? I think uh, on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Yes, at, at, at SCATL um, and hashtag SCATL. I believe are the handles. Um, and my team might kill me that I don't know that off the bat, but I do believe that those are it. And maybe you can post it. Uh, when you when you post this, I think you are right. I think that is correct. Um, and I and in fact, in the show notes, when people are listening to the podcast on this and on YouTube, I'll have it in the links below. So feel free to to look through okay. that. And I'll tag uh, the Facebook page when we um, when this is up and uh, going. Perfect. And can I just uh, yes? And then um, I'll send you a uh, a link. And perfect. Great. Great. Yeah. So I'm going to sign off, but you hang in there with me for a minute, Artie. Thank you, everyone, for. Being with us, this is an interview with Artie Tandon, CEO and co-founder of Smart City Expo Atlanta. My name is Rico Figliolini, host of Peace for Corners Life, publisher of Peace for Corners Magazine. Find us at livinginpeacefreecorners.com, and I appreciate you joining us. Thank you.